Professor Nozek is co-founder and executive director of the Center for Open Science Framework, where researchers can register, archive, and share their research materials, where we also share our course material, by the way. Uh, he's also a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia, and he's an influential researcher in the field of large-scale replication studies and reprodu reproducibility of research. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Nozek. Thank you very much uh, for having me. I'm delighted uh, to be able to present uh, with this group today. What I would uh, like to do is, and I will share my screen in the meantime, uh, is to give you a, an overview of the problem uh, as we see it uh, for what to solve with open science and a basic idea of the strategy, our approach uh, to trying to address it. My origins uh, is as a researcher in psychology uh, and my area of expertise is implicit bias thoughts and feelings outside of awareness and control and how they might influence our everyday judgments and behavior that lead us to do things differently than what our conscious intentions are. And the way I characterize that interest is that the core goal that we have to try to understand in our laboratory work is the gap between values and practices. What we think we should do, what we want to do, what we're trying to do versus what we actually do in our everyday behavior. And how is it that the limitations of our own minds uh, and the cultural context in which we are embedded, the systems, the policies, the incentives, the norms uh, can shape our behaviors in ways that are not to what we think are the ideals of how we'd like to share, do our behaviors, how we'd like to behave. The Center for Open Science is really a practical application of that basic research interest. The core goal of COS is to address the gap between scientific values and what are everyday scientific practices. And what are the factors that are leading us away from the ideals that we have for science? Uh, and how can we change the system, change the incentives, the cultural landscape, the things that uh, individual behaviors are limited in their own ability to do, but that we can do more effectively together uh, to try to improve and accelerate discovery of knowledge and solutions and cures of whatever it is the problems that we're studying. So to give some context to that, let me begin uh, with what are the values of science? What are the ideals that we might aspire to that we can uh, assess against whether we're living up to them? And there are a variety of ways that we could talk about the values of science. The one that I like to use uh, in this kind of setting is Robert Merton's Norms of Science. Uh, Merton was a sociologist of science in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and he identified what he considered to be four key norms of what makes science distinct as a way of knowing things about the world. The first was communality, the open sharing of information. A scientific claim doesn't become credible because someone is famous or an authority or just say, trust me, a scientific claim becomes credible by me being able to show you, here's the methodology that I used, here's the data that I generated, here's the way that I applied inference to that data to come to the claims that I think now you should believe uh, that I also believe, All right? Versus the counter norm of, no, 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 just trust me. That's what I found, trust me, that's, that's what it is. The second Mertonian norm is universalism. Research is evaluated based on its own merit. It's the methodology, the data, the quality of the inference itself that determines its credibility rather than the fame or authority of the person speaking it. The third norm is disinterested, disinterestedness. Researchers are motivated by knowledge and discovery, just trying to figure it all out, just trying to understand the problem that they're investigating versus the counter norm of self-interestedness. Really, I'm here to get all the grants and to get the papers and to get ahead of the person down the hall so that I get the job and the rewards, et cetera. And then the fourth norm is organized skepticism. A researcher considers all new evidence, even against their prior work, versus organized dogmatism, that really what I'm here to do is defend my prior claims against all of those attackers so that my claims win uh, and I get to preserve my authority through that. And while Merton didn't talk about it, 
a common discussion of other norms of, uh, in science is a norm of quality versus a norm of quantity, just turning things out. So we might recognize those as norms in the general sense of how science is characterized, but do researchers actually endorse those norms? Do they believe that's how science should operate? Anderson and her colleagues did a survey of about 3,300 NIH awardees. And what they categorize here is early career researchers in postdoctoral positions, mid-career researchers that were in their first R01 awards. The average age in that sample is about 40. What you're seeing here is a cumulative plot of their responses to endorsing the norm or the counter norm of the previous slide. So in gray are those that on average endorse the norms over the counter norms. I think science should be open, dis self, disinterested, et cetera. Uh, and you can see 90% of the sample is saying, yeah, I agree with Merton's norms of science over the counter norms. In black are those that said, no, no, I think science should operate by the counter norms over the norms, almost no one. And then the gray hatches are people who essentially gave equal weight uh, to these. So then Anderson and her colleague said, okay, that's fine. Don't tell me what you endorse, how you think it should be. Tell me how you behave. What do you do in your everyday research? And it looks like this. So still most people are saying they behave according to the norms of science over the counter norms. But now a much more substantial uh, group are saying that those counter norms also have weight uh, in their behavior about equivalent. And still very, very few say it, they behave according to the counter norms versus the norms. So then they said, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Don't tell me what you do. Tell me what the other people in your field, what do they do? It looks like this, right? This is the dysfunctional culture. We all individually, not all, effectively all individually endorse the norms of how science should operate. We largely try to live up to those, but recognize the pressures of those counter norms. And we perceive that others, which are the same people, the others of us around us, do not behave according to those norms. That the culture actually incentivizes, reinforces, embodies those counter norms of self-interest, reputation by authority, secrecy, et cetera, over how we think science should operate. So the core challenge to address, if we want to improve the uh, way science operates, uh, is to close this gap is what we perceive as the culture endorsing, the challenges that we face in trying to live in that culture and align it with the values that we collectively have for science. Because this gap creates a very difficult situation for any individual in that research culture. If I perceive the culture to be against the values that I have, I have to make a choice. I could live by my values but undermine the likelihood that I actually can succeed and thrive in the research community. Or I can say, well, my values aren't valued here, so I need to do what it takes to succeed, to get a job, to keep a job, to advance in my career, and therefore do things that are actually counter to what I think are the ways that things should be done. And that's not a healthy research culture. So that's what we want to solve. Now, there are lots of ways to talk about what the challenges are. For us, it boils down to this as the key problem, is that the incentives for my success are focused on me getting it published, not on me getting it right. Of course, I want to get it right. I didn't get into science to write papers. No one got into science to write papers. We get into science because we're curious about things. We're trying to solve problems. We want to make progress on this. We like the process of discovery, whatever all those altruistic uh, and interested motivations are for actually investigating the problems that we study. But once we are in science, it is, becomes very clear what it takes to stay in science. And a big part of that is that the currency of advancement is publication, that I need to produce papers in order to advance in that career. And of course, while I want to get it right, not everything gets published. We know that some things are more likely to publish, be published than others. I'm more likely to get published if I find a positive result than a negative result. Those are more interesting, more exciting, more evidence of advancement of new learning. Right? I'm more likely to get published if I find something new, a novel finding, rather than repeating something that someone else has claimed previously, even if it improves confidence in that claim. And I'm more likely to get published if the evidence that I provide in that paper is a neat and tidy story, all fits together, 
provides evidence and support for the bigger picture claims that I make. So a positive, novel, tidy story is the best kind of story in science. Because it is, right? You discover something new, you have a full explanation for it and all the evidence supports it, that's amazing. The problem, of course, is that that does not happen very often. And when it does happen, it happens very slowly and cumulatively over time of many investigations, lots of false starts, things that don't make sense. And over the course of a program of research, we get to clarity and that beauty that we aspire to. But the individual units of reward are at the paper level, which don't often have that clarity. There's all kinds of things that don't make sense, all kinds of exceptions, things that don't fit. The messiness is part of the process of basic research and discovery. But we're incentivized to disguise it. We're incentivized to ignore the negative results. We're incentivized to provide a clean and tidy story. We're incentivized to say, it's new, it's groundbreaking, it's innovative, every single time. And that creates a problem because we also have lots of discretion. We have lots of opportunity to exploit things without even intending to that can reduce the credibility of those claims. So if we think at the top, we have these incentives to create these beautiful papers and those incentives lead to opportunities of exploitation that reduce the credibility of the claims, right? So selective reporting is one that's well-documented. Public positive results are much more likely to appear in papers, much more likely than, than they can actually occur given the power of research designs uh, and negative results are likely to be ignored. I have lots of opportunity to employ questionable research practices, right? I could analyze my data in lots of ways. Some of those ways will look better for publication than others. If I'm analyzing my data, interacting with it, I might start to rationalize that those outcomes that look better for me are in fact the right ways to analyze and report the findings and ignore the others, right? Overfitting uh, becomes a big problem. Lack of transparency or sharing. It's not in my interest to show you all my work and to share my data because the only thing that could happen is that you find an error and that's not good uh, for my key reward. And why would I bother replicating my work or yours? Because what's valued uh, is novel positive results. And once I have a finding, conducting a replication to see if I can actually reproduce it can only mean that I lose this thing, nugget, this gold that I have that can advance my career. All of those behaviors then can damage what it is we're in the business of doing. We can reduce the credibility of the literature and we don't provide opportunities for self-correction. Those processes that we presume are the natural process in science of there's gonna be lots of error, that's expected, but let's efficiently discover the false leads, the things that don't quite fit, the things that are much more constrained than we thought at first by having a cumulative science that constantly questions itself. That can't happen without sufficient transparency or with ethics like doing replications. And all of that results in waste. So I'm making the case for the purposes of this presentation of just this conceptually. If we want in the Q&A to talk about the evidence about each of these sorts of paths and the cumulative effect on the credibility of the literature, uh, that's great uh, Q&A discussion. But I'm going to take it on at this point that this is the state uh, that we are in, that we could be much more efficient than we are presently because of a lot of these factors in play. And what I want to do for the rest of the time is talk about our change strategy, how we think about the approach to trying to shift the research culture, and then I'll give you a couple of examples of interventions. So our theory of change model, you can think of in terms of this pyramid in the middle. And the pyramid doesn't mean that we have to do the lower ones first. It means that success for the things at the higher level are contingent on successful implementation at the lower levels. So at the base, if we want people to do behaviors that are credibility enhancing, for example, registering their studies so that you can identify the ones that didn't make it into the paper, and you can identify what analysis were planned in advance versus discovered after the fact, you need infrastructure that makes that possible. You need to think about how to make that infrastructure easy to use uh, because researchers are busy. And if you don't think about their idiosyncratic workflows and support the way they do their work, 
then it's going to be very hard for them to adopt new behaviors uh, into those workflows. Simultaneously, if science is not hierarchical, the way in which we decide how do we behave in science is based on very small group peer communities. What do people in my field do? What do people in my institution, my lab group, my program, what do they do? So the norms that develop within those sub-communities are the key, a key driver for how people adopt uh, different behaviors. Oh, this is how we do things here. Okay, that's the things that I'm going to do then. Then on top of that are the incentives, right? It's fine that other people are doing this nice behavior, but I'm not rewarded for it. Why would I actually do that behavior? So actually thinking about how the incentives align with the norms and the goals that we have are critical for getting full adoption. And then finally at the top there are the policies, right? The stakeholder communities, the institutions, the funders, the journals uh, provide a framework of these are the things you have to do uh, in order to get the rewards within our particular domain. So though all of those are necessary and none of them are individually sufficient to shift a research culture. But we also can think about this culture change in terms of change models in general, right? There's a classic model diffusion of innovations. It's rotated on its side on the left of this graph of how it is that new technologies get adopted in communities. And this is the origin uh, of uh, the, the Roger, early Rogers work in the 1960s, origin of the term early adopters, right? There are different motivations for people that are willing to try new technologies or new behaviors uh, at different points in the adoption life cycle of any new technology, right? Innovators at that outset are interested in the new technology for the new technology's sake. Oh, I want to try pre-registration because that sounds interesting. I'm motivated to try it. So just making it possible to do it is sufficient for innovators to jump in. They see promise and possibility and they want to test the boundaries of new kinds of behaviors. Right? Early adopters are those that see the potential, the vision, what this could accomplish. Oh, I see that this could be really great for science, could be great for my work, and I'm willing to jump in and do it regardless of what the current culture supports and expects. And so making it easy for them to integrate in their workflow might be sufficient for those early adopters to engage in those behaviors. If you can make that early adopter behavior visible to others, that is a stimulus agent for starting to change norms. So to get into the mainstream, that early majority, you have to make visible that other people are starting to do these behaviors that align with the values that we have uh, for, those, uh, for the, the research community. Oh, I see now other people are doing it. Maybe I'll do it too. And the great thing about norms is that they pile on themselves. Once some people start to do it, it makes, if it's visible, the other people are more likely to do it, which makes more people do it, which makes it more visible, which makes it more likely that more people are going to do it. Norms are awesome for spreading new behavior, but it's not going to be enough for everybody. So those incentives will pull along the rest uh, of uh, the mainstream. And then of course, there's always a people that say, I've been doing it this way for 50 years. I don't need any new ways of doing things. I'm fine the way I am. But those laggards, if you say, well, do you want the money for this grant? Yeah, I want the money. You have to do the behavior. All right, fine. I'll do the behavior. Okay, so that in con concept is the overall model for thinking about behavior change. At the base, most of what we do at COS uh, is su that supporting technology, the infrastructure, and then working on increasingly making it easier and easier for researchers to adopt. So if you go to osf.io, uh, you can try that out. It uh, supports the entire research lifecycle uh, and is a collaborative management service that enables the registration, enables data sharing, enables you to do it all privately and make it public when you want to. I'm not going to say anything more about the technology, even though uh, that's what we spend most of our time worrying about. I want to spend the last bits of time uh, on the three stages above it, norms, incentives, and policies, to just give you illustration of how we think about moving these that the technology then supports the adoption of those behaviors. So the first example is the easiest type of intervention. And this is really for that point between early adopters and getting into the mainstream. How is it that we can get people to think that the norms might actually be shifting? And the key way that norms can shift is, by, is as a signaling function, is if you can make people adopting those behaviors visible, then that increasing visibility is a mechanism 
for shifting norms. I see that people are doing this. Maybe this is a thing we do now. Okay, maybe I should do it too. And an easy signaling mechanism is badges of those desired behaviors. So these three badges, open data, open materials, pre-registration, are things that journals can adopt and offer to their authors when their paper is accepted. If you meet the criteria for open data, we'll put this badge on your paper and then a link uh, to where the data is. Still up to you to do it or not, but it's just a little incentive to say, here, we've got a stamp of approval on this behavior that people think is valued. And as an incentive, it's very small, right? Those, those research authors, why do I need a badge? Badge, that's silly. Uh, but as a signaling function for the readers of that journal, of those articles, it starts to elevate the idea that people do this behavior. People start to do share data. People are pre-registering in my field. And at scale, that could have a substantial impact. So even though it's a simple and trivial intervention, the question is, is it sufficient for when people who are motivated idealistically do the behavior, it becomes more visible, do others start to then adopt the behavior? So we did an evaluation of the first journal that adopted badges, a journal with psychological science, and it adopted badges on January 1st, 2014. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is the two years prior to its adoption, uh, Psych Science in black, and then four comparison journals that publish similar things from the same community in gray. And on the y-axis is the percent of articles in those journals reporting that they had open data available uh, in a repository. So you can see that the rates for psychological science were about 3% of articles in 2012 and 2013 had open data. Badges are adopted January 1st, 2014, and this is what happens, right? Within 18 months, almost 40% of the articles in psych science had open data, no change in the comparison journals. If you look at it this year or last year, the rates are now about 80%, 85% open data in psychological science. And that's probably about the top amount that's possible uh, in psychology because of some data sets not being shareable for uh, reasons primarily of research ethics rather than intellectual property. Uh, but it is essentially now the norm to share data in this journal rather than not to share. The badge was the mechanism for making it visible that this behavior is happening. And psychological science did an amazing job of maximizing that visibility in all its communications. So people really know whether this particular article has open data or not. There are now about 60 journals that offer uh, badges, and so we're continuing some of these evaluations to see how much this generalizes. But it's promising evidence that even small interventions, when the behavior is already valued, can have a substantial impact on the outcome. Second intervention is really about thinking of those, inter those incentives. Publication is the currency of advancement. We need publications. So can we, instead of trying to change that and say, oh, we don't need publications anymore, that's not gonna change easily. Instead, can we shift the criteria for publications to align better with the values that we have for how science should be evaluated and decisions made for publication? And that's the key idea of registered reports, right? So here's the cartoon version of how research gets done, right? You design a study, you collect, analyze the data, you write the report, you publish it. Of course, it's not that easy because there's that big barrier of peer review after you've written the report before you publish it. Now in this context, all of the incentives are make that report as publishable as possible so that eventually peer reviewers will, will relent and say, fine, allow it to be published. The key change with registered reports is that the primary review stage moves to just after the design stage. So with a registered report submission, you write up your initial experiments, right? The discovery oriented stuff, we're not quite sure what's uh, happening, but you're just trying to establish the methodology or initial evidence. Uh, you write up proposed methodology for your key experiment or experiments, uh, and then how you would analyze the data and you submit that to the journal. The journal then evaluates the importance of the question, the viability of the approach uh, you're taking and the quality of the methodology. Uh, that you propose to do the studies before anyone knows what the outcomes are. If it passes peer review at this stage, then it gets in principle acceptance. And what that means is that as long as you follow through with saying what you doing what you said you were going to do, we will publish it. And at the second stage of evaluation, we're not going to evaluate whether the results are interesting or came out as they expected. 
we're going to evaluate whether you did what you said and whether you interpret it reasonably. And so what this fundamentally changes is the incentives for me as an author. Right? What I need to do now is ask really important questions and design excellent methods to test those questions. The results are going to be the results. My, my reward publication is not contingent on the results outcomes. So it shifts dramatically, and there's lots more we can talk about with this, but it shifts dramatically how it is we get our rewards, but it raises lots of questions for people about what's then the downstream implications for what happens with the research. So I'll just give a couple of examples of the evaluations that have been done so far on registered reports. What I'm showing you here is a comparison of articles that are done the traditional way, traditional literature, what percentage of them report null findings as a primary result versus registered reports. How often are null results end up being the, the primary output? What you see here in this analysis is that about 10% of the traditional literature gets nulls. Almost everything's a positive result in the regular articles in these journals. Uh, and then with registered reports, it's about 60% are showing null results, whether it's a replication study or whether it's a novel finding. That is showing the elimination of publication bias, right? When we don't know the results and we're evaluating, is this an important question? Do we need to know the answer? Then a lot of the time we find out, hmm, what we expected isn't what occurred. Doesn't mean it's entirely wrong, but it could mean uh, that we need to change our approach a little bit, or at least we need to investigate in a different way. And we lose uh, the negative impact of publication bias. When we show these data to uh, editors, that don't yet offer registered reports. Many of them say, oh, that's why I'm not gonna offer registered reports in my journal, because then I'll have all these negative results and then no one will cite the papers in my journal and then I'll have ruined the journal and then I'll be the worst editor ever. Now, it, we may not agree with the rationale that one should evaluate a journal based on how many times the papers in it are cited, but nevertheless, it is a realistic issue that people raise uh, and have as a concern. So it's worth examining whether their concern has merit. And so this is an analysis of citation rates for registered report articles versus comparison articles published in the same journal at the same time. And a value of 100 would mean that the registered reports and comparison articles are cited at the same amount. And this is looked at, we looked at three different uh, databases, Google Scholar, Scopus, Web of Science, and positive values over the 100 uh, indicate that the registered reports were cited more than uh, the similar articles that are the comparison articles. So if anything, across these uh, journals, we have equivalence or maybe slightly even more citation uh, for on average for the registered report articles. There, we can only speculate as to the reasons why. To me, uh, there's a primary, most obvious reason uh, for why it is that we end up with citation rates that meet or potentially exceed that in the register reports versus the others. And that is that if everyone agrees in advance that we need to know the answer to this particular research question that's posed, then any outcome is a meaningful outcome. And one of the great benefits of registered reports is that the, res the papers themselves end up being higher quality papers in terms of rigor and methodology. Because what happens is that the reviewers, instead, uh, the reviewers say, oh, here's a weakness in your design, or here's a weakness in the methodology, here's a change I think you should make. And instead of having to just feel bad that I didn't think of that, because the research is already done, I as an author get to say, oh, that's a great idea. And I incorporate it into my design, because I haven't done it yet. And so reviewers can actually shape the direction of the research and the quality of the research rather than just pointing out all of its flaws. So both of those together, I think, enhance uh, what, what we're seeing from the register reports uh, work. We actually have an evaluation study of the quality of the register reports versus comparison articles that's just about ready uh, for release and it affirms uh, what, what I just said. All right, I'll stop with there uh, and just say a couple more things uh, and then close so we can have some discussion. Another element uh, for this in terms of thinking about those norms, incentives, and policies is to engage the policy makers, funders, institutions, journals, to actually start to 
make themselves visible as supporting improved rigor and transparency. So one of the key things that we do is try to get these uh, different stakeholders to work together to have a much bigger social impact on their fields by promoting uh, special issues or other kinds of uh, interventions to promote good practice. So this is just one example of uh, the flu lab, a funder of influenza research, uh, and PLOS uh, working together to promote publication of null results and registered reports to do replications of prior findings in this field. Uh, you go through a single review process. If you, are, uh, if you make it through peer review, you get the funding to do the study and the commitment to the publication. And everybody in this circle likes it because the author says, I have to submit once and I get the money and the paper, sign me up. Funder says, wait, so the funding that I give, most of it will end up being published instead of tons of the funds that I deliver to uh, as grants never get published at all, it's just waste. Okay, I'm on board. And then the publisher says, we're gonna get high quality proposals and get funded research. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're in. So it is a very easy thing to get uh, groups aligned on because it's all in their interest uh, to promote these good practices. And so this has been a very successful intervention strategy for us. So I'll close now just with saying this isn't all in theory. There's a lot of stuff happening in practice. I've emphasized some of the things that we are doing at COS, but obviously the open science community is large, it's diverse, and there's lots of activities happening. Uh, but we have immediate data for the things that we do just to provide evidence uh, of the success that's been happening across research communities about advancement of open science. So if you just look, for example, at uh, OSF adoption, uh, the number of users, uh, this is showing the growth rate over time. Uh, we just passed 250,000 users uh, this, uh, this past few weeks. Uh, and uh, the growth trajectory is continuing to be nonlinear. And in fact, any indicator that you select uh, for adoption of these practices shows that nonlinear growth. Uh, this is a curve that we do not want to flatten uh, for behaviors uh, in adopting open science. So the number of registrations uh, on OSF, uh, the number of things shared openly. Uh, so here's uh, preprints, files added just last year, more than 2.8 million, a million of those public. Uh, those numbers continue uh, to accelerate. And it is not just people putting stuff up and then it sitting there and dying. There's also a whole user community that is 10 times the size of the producer community that is actually using the research that people are making openly available. So this just for example is the number of unique users each year uh, on OSF. It's already far in excess of that uh, in 2020 from what we see in 2019 downloading uh, you know, 16 million of these files that have been shared, data, materials, protocols, and otherwise. I suspect that most of the other services uh, that promote open science behaviors have similar looking curves uh, across this time span, given the intense growth uh, and engagement uh, with open science. So, but there's, it's simultaneously, it's far from done, right? It is a very complex ecosystem for how it is that the incentives for any individual researcher are shaped by the university or institution that they're part of, the publishers that they publish in, the societies that they're members of and the funders that fund them. And we have to solve that coordination problem where all of these have to move in concert to some degree to really shift the research culture to have lasting change. And that is the real challenge that we face now uh, for aligning the open science efforts into uh, uh, sustainable culture change. So there's lots of uh, resources that I mentioned. There are links here. You see at the very bottom, there's a link to these slides uh, if you'd like to access them. And there's a bunch of additional slides in the back. Uh, so just go there and, and get these. And thanks very much for your time and attention. Delighted to speak with you today.